So, from one great poet, poet, the immortal memory for another great poet, Liz Lockett. Thank you very much. It's a huge honour to be doing The Immortal Memory. I've never done The Immortal Memory before. <coughs> I've done more, I've, um, I've um, done more um, replies to the toast to the lasses than Joe Clifford could shake a stick at <laughs> over the years. But uh, it's a big honour to be doing The Immortal Memory. And I'm determined it's not going to be a big long one. Um, I've, I've sat through some Immortal Memories where people are, um, you know, dissecting the minutiae of a great man's life. And I'm going to kind of give you my, a lot of the time, my personal burns. Because how on earth, whoops, I'm going to look at my watch first, yes. Because um, how on earth do you take an ideal, an icon? How do you get somebody from off the short bed tin and make them live and breathe? I would like tonight to present a man of contradictions. I'd like to present a view of one who was externally by circumstance beset. Internally, a deeply conflicted, contradictory, complex character in his struggle to be the poet he could not be. He had to be a poet. In his struggle simply to, to survive and to be a man. A man of his time, an intellectual, a European, deeply steeped in the vernacular of his own patch and parish. So there's a lot of contradictions, or, or not contradictions, um, paradoxes or balances. Uh, a Republican, and yet an inveterate sucker up to aristocracy. <laughs> the supporter of the French Revolution, who famously sang Sa Ira in the theatre in Dumfries, but who, a decade earlier, had quite willingly almost gone to work on a slave trade plantation in the West Indies. A self-inventing, furiously <coughs> creative, fantastically pro prolific, poetic genius who wrote most of the poems chiefly in the Scots dialect. That's the poems that he's famous for. Those ones, he wrote them all before he was 27 in an incredible 18 months of what seems to bear all the, the hallmarks of a furious and charismatic manic high, because who also in his 30s, a muse abandoned melancholic who self-medicated our much whiles with the booze and the barmaid, a brave and a selfless and for no financial gain, collector and improver and maker of songs when the poems didn't come. And they did stop coming from him in the last 10 years of his life, except for Tam O'Shanter. Um, Tam O'Shanter was dictated to him by the muse, I think. And there's reports of him walking on the other side of the nith from his family. And Jean Armour sending, um, sending uh, one of the, the boys over with soup for him as they could see him wandering the other side of the river, muttering as he composed this in rhyming couplets. Not, I mean, Tam O'Shanter's not in Standard Abbey, not in what we think of as the Burns lyric. So he was one who penned the most tender love lyrics, and then, without drawing a breath, the filthiest and the funniest body songs for all the roaring lads of Tur Turbolton Bachelors Club and the Crochalan Fencibles. And he was a rock star handsome hit of the Edinburgh Salons, just after his book came out, and a failed farmer on his lonely furrow. He was a true lover and a loser in love, a ranting, roaring Scottish Don Juan <laughs> and a meek, socially conforming penitent in church, an irresponsible, sexually promiscuous and serially unfaithful husband and a loving father who took his parental responsibilities very, very seriously, heartbreakingly seriously, and to always, almost, also managed to love his wife. Maybe he wasn't in love with her all the time, but he always loved his wife. As the poet Don Patterson, uh, a contemporary, well, you know, he's younger than me, Don. I'm sorry, he's nothing like a contemporary of mine. But the great poet Don Patterson says, 
And this is an important point. There is no reason to believe that he inhabited one character with any less sincerity than another. Even although one Robert Burns might later comment very wryly on the other one's conduct. So I'd like to contrast two songs together. I thought I'd liven up my um, uh, my immortal memory by using some of the great, great songs. And I've got, um, first of all, um, Ryan. Is Ryan about? Oh, Ryan's there. Hi, Ryan. Ryan Burns, yes. I'm going to invite Ryan Burns to sing a very familiar Burns song, one kind of Burns song. Please sing, just for me. Give me a man's a man for all that. <coughs> um, I learned the song on the way to the pub last night. <laughs> Someone just. Sense and worth, O 
Lord of the earth shall bear the grief for all that, for all that, and all that it's coming yet for all that, that man to man the world or shall brothers be. That man to man the world shall brothers be for all Thanks, folks. Universal sentiments, um, a plea for democracy and things that any sensible person would uh, agree with. A sloganeering poem, though, in a sense, I mean, a sloganeering song. Um, I thought probably started off life as a poem. I once had to do it in the parliament as a poem, and it was very interesting because for all that and all that meant something different in some of the sentences, whereas when it's tune, you know, the tune makes it have a similar meaning. Very, very interesting song, but a huge big song, you know, saying big things about what the world should be like. I'd like to contrast that completely with one of my very favourite Burns songs for very personal reasons, and I'm not ashamed to you know, make my first ever, and I hope it's not my last, immortal memory, full of things that I love myself. My dad used to sing me to sleep. He hoped with this song, Bonnie Wee Thing, and the lovely Tom Yuri is going to sing that for me as well. I'm taking it all personally. <laughs> my jewel I should time wistfully I look and languish in that bonny face of thine and my heart it sounds with anguish bless my weeping Ne'er be mine, bonnie wee thing, canny wee thing, lovely wee thing, where thou mine, I would wear thee in my bosom, lost my jewel, I should thine, wet and grace and love. And a constellation shine to adore thee is my duty, goddess of the soul of mine. Bonny we thing, canny we thing, lovely we thing, worth thou mine. I wear thee in my bosom, lest my jewel I should take. I needed a sneeze all the way through that song. It's still, and then it's vanished and I feel robbed. Sorry. 
beautiful. Thanks, Liz. Just beautiful. Um, they couldn't be more different, but they came from the same person. Now, despite every burn supper I've ever been to being longer than the tattoo, <laughs> despite Hume and Dermot <coughs> being absolutely spot on when he said, mere nonsense has been uttered in his name than in Oni's barren liberty and Christ. <laughs> Nevertheless, Robert Burns, you remain my hero. Not just mine. Here tonight is Ur Rave, your Rave, Obadi's Rave. <laughs> Impossible, Rab, to think of you merely as a poet. You're more a myth. A myth, according to Edwin Muir, the poet, that we Scots shape to our own likeness. A myth endlessly adaptable. He said, to the respectable, very, very few of them here tonight, by the way, but to the respectable, yes, I have had a good look at you. <laughs> no. But one of those respectable people we might know, to them, to the respectable, he was a decent man. To the Ravalesian, body. To the sentimentalist, sentimental. To the socialist, a revolutionary. To the nationalist, a patriot. To the religious, pious, and so on. It's true, you see, that he did inhabit all these different personae. And, this is a trick, with such conviction, such a vigorous and distinct range of voices that he took on with such apparent sincerity. And he was a truly complex individual, a character full of contradictions, but never, never hypocritical. He was a man of many parts, was Robert Burns. He could actually almost, um, almost inhabit two different opinions at the same time. He was so passionate, but not a hypocrite. Um, quoting Don Patterson again, Burns's truest song. Now, all poets, I'm afraid, we all sing the song of ourselves. And what we all hope for is that if we sing the song of ourselves, that'll make sense to everybody else because we're not in any way special people. But Burns's truest song is simple, according to Don, my friend. He says, his song is, man is complicated. Now, we would like to sing it because as for the many songs of being human, Burns believed that you sang, if you sang one, you should sing them all. Um, Burns was an internationalist, but he was also intensely local. He really loved the Ayrshire um, landscape and nature of his own place. And uh, I'm going to ask my dear friend Francis Comerford to come up now and sing a beautiful, beautiful landscape poem set in Ayrshire. And it's one of my favourites. In fact, it's one that um, I tried to sing at the Burns Miners Welfare competition, and I could sing name ever. Um, so, Francis, will you come and sing just for me and for everybody else? Yeah? Yeah? Nice. Nice. He's going to sing, Ye Banks and Braes or Bonnie Doon.
For a week, I happen to know this because I'm one of Francis's friends. She's going to be playing Judy Garland in something at the Oran Moor. It'll be on all week, every day, from Monday to Friday. From uh, yeah, and uh, I shouldn't maybe have I shouldn't maybe have said that because I'm scared in case I'll not get a ticket now. Um, but I better get a ticket now. I don't, you know, I've never really wanted to. I, I would be, I would never have been able in my life to become a critic. Because if I see a painting I really like, what I want to say is not the story of the painter's life and this and that, I want to go, look at that. When I want to talk about a, a bit of food that I've loved, I want to go, oh, I taste that, isn't it brilliant? I want to go, hmm, that's a really nice perfume. Is that Tom Ford? <laughs> so I really, you know, absolutely, um, really wanted to be talking about Burns as a person, but mostly to be letting you hear some of the fabulous things he did because he um, went around the countryside. His version of, now nowadays, he, were, he was a collector of folk songs. Um, he was apparently a fairly indifferent fiddler, but he used his fiddle as a recording machine. Nowadays, he would have been recording people on his, on his phone, you know? Um, and keeping them, but he would learn the tune, and then he would go back to where he was lodging when he was, and he would uh, say the the words of the song out loud till he got the the rhythm and things and the melody, and then he expanded upon quite a lot of wee fragments of songs and turned them into the greatest songs in the world. Now I don't want you to think I only like his songs. I thought I would like to read the first Burns poem that I ever learned myself, and it's one you know. I don't need to read it really, but I'm just. Looking up, I sometimes get the order of two of the verses in the wrong order. So I'll just check that I wouldn't. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Anyway, it's the one that I learned when I was 10 and that I never got anywhere in the Burns um, Miners' Welfare uh, competition with. My mother used to say, it's because we're incomers. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to read... It's not my favourite Burns poem because I've got too many favourites. I've got a different um, favourite for every different person that I am. So, but this is to a mouse. And it's, how could somebody take look at a wee mouse and see those wee black eyes and address a great big poem about green issues to a wee, to a wee mouse and, and make it, you know, just make such wonderful sense. I mean, the poem is actually called To a Mouse on Turning Her Up in Her Nest with the Plough, November 1785. That day, that very day. Wee, slick it, curin, timorous beastie. Oh, what a panic's in thy breastie. Thou needna start a wassy hasty with bicker and brattle. I would be loath to run and chase thee with murder and paddle. I'm truly sorry man's dominion has broken nature's social union and justifies that ill opinion which makes thee startle at me, thy poor earthborn companion and fellow mortal. I doubt in a while, but thou mon thieve. What then? Poor beastie thou mon live. A dame a nicker and a thraves a small request. I'll get a blessing with a lave and never miss it. Thy wee bit hoosie to in ruins, 
It's silly was the winds are strewing, and Nathan knew to big a new in of foggage green, and bleak December's winds ensuing, both snell and keen. Thou saw the fields laid bare and wast, and weary winter coming fast, and cosy here beneath the blast, thou thought to dwell, <coughs> till crash the cruel coulter passed out through thy cell. That wee bit heap o' leaves and stibble has cost thee money a weary nibble. Now thou's turned out for all thy trouble, but house nor hold to thaw the winter's sleety dribble and cranroch cold. But Moosey, thou art no thy lane, and proving foresight may be vain. The best laid schemes o' mice and men gang after glee, and Leah's noch but grief and pain for promised joy. Still, thou art blessed compared with me, the present only toucheth thee, but och I backward cast my e on prospects drear. And forward, though I canna see, I guess and fear. When I was ten, I used to think it was about mice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like you to charge your glasses and toast the immortal memory of Robert Burns. To Robert Burns. Thank you. And that should be the clapping point, but, no, but, but, I've got a cheeky wee thing to do, because I like to be cheeky. Um, I know I'm going to ask for two more songs and I'm going to go and sit down because I knew that I couldn't trust myself to hear these next two songs and be able to say the immortal memory of Robert Burns. So I'm going to just ask Francis and Tom to sing two wonderful poems, uh, wonderful songs, and I don't need to tell you what they are. And I'm going to sit there and listen. And... Sometimes I can hear them without tears streaming down my face. Sometimes I can't. Thanks.